Okay, so we are looking at day nine here. Uh, we're looking at training our muscular system today. So we're going to talk a lot about like the different the parts that go into, you know, what we consider uh, when we are putting together like, you know, muscular exercise, right? We've kind of talked, um, you know, a little bit about, you know, we, we, we're going to talk about the cardio tomorrow. We've talked about the sort of overall philosophy of like, you know, make sure you're being specific, make sure you're, you're overloading, you know, all those principles that we talked about yesterday. Um, but today we're going to look at like, you know, what is it particularly that you need to consider uh, when it comes to like developing muscle, right? And so we're going to look at the idea of like what strength really is, how and how to test for it. Um, different parts of muscular contractions, we'll review that again. So concentric, eccentric, isometric. Um, we will look at uh, uh, a little bit talking about like one rep maxing, um, isometric exercise and how that can result in strength, um, variable resistance training, plyometrics, which is huge. Uh, and then talking about like force versus power. Uh, and then the different types of adaptations that we have, neural adaptations versus, mus uh, versus size versus power and things like that. Um, so our objectives today are to kind of get through the basic principles for developing strength, um, the differences between aerobic power and muscular strength, because obviously those are two very different things, um, our different types of contractions, like I mentioned, uh, the ways that we measure strength, you know, whether that's through one rep max testing or, you know, uh, maybe some other uh, method, um, variable resistance training, which is always kind of fun, you know, what happens when you mess with uh, uh, how you are loading an exercise uh, and uh, sort of talk a little bit about muscle soreness and where that comes from. Uh, any of the cardiorespiratory adaptations that do actually happen during uh, muscular adaptations. And then we're going to kick everything off at the very end of this lesson by talking about one of the most important parts of strength training, which is actually the flexibility portion uh, and how important it is to make sure that we are trying to maintain our flexibility. Uh, so we will talk about the different types of stretches and how those stretches will actually interact here at the end. So um, taking a look at it, right, when we look at like the principles of, of, you know, developing, you know, muscular strength, right? So this, this like I said, this is the strength training day for the most part. And so muscular strength, when we, when we define that, right, uh, it's the amount of force that your muscles can exert against some type of resistive force, right? So, you know, um, if you know if my muscles can grab like a barbell uh and do like a, a barbell curl for a maximum of you know we'll just say 50 pounds right well then you know that's how much force my muscles can generate they can generate 50 pounds worth of tension and you know that'll overcome 50 or less pounds right like i can overcome that resistive force um so that's really what we're looking at right when we look at like how we're measuring things we're looking at like resistive force uh, versus like internal tension. That's what your muscles do, right? They, they generate internal tension with all those proteins that we've been talking about. So, you know, there's a lot of different factors that, that contribute to the idea of like force, right? Um, obviously there's the, the synthesis of contractile proteins. So your body making new proteins, the more actin, the more myosin that you have, you know, those actin and myosin proteins, which grab each other and pull, um, you know, the more of those that you have, obviously the stronger your muscle cell can be because you've got, it's almost like having more people on a tug of war, right? Um, your muscle fiber type is going to have to do that. When you look at the characteristics of your muscle, is it, you know, full of, is it like very large and has a lot of cellular volume? Uh, does it have a lot of those proteins? Does it uh, get a really high delivery of uh, myoglobin or a really high delivery of, of hemoglobin, um, those things that are giving us the, you know, fuel on the go. You know, type one muscle fibers, which are great for endurance and they get a lot of fuel, uh, are just not as good at generating high levels of internal tension. And so uh, in terms of strength, type one fibers are going to be weaker, but your type two fibers are going to be stronger. And so, you know, what do you have more of? Um, and then sometimes like, what's the point of your tendon insertion? Cause this is kind of an interesting one. Um, so sometimes we'll look at like where a muscle has its tendon inserting, uh, and that actually changes how much force that it can generate actually. So, you know, uh, take a look here, actually, you can see like, if I kind of, you know, squeeze my bicep here, you can see, I kind of got a big, big freaking gap here, uh, between like my bicep and like the rest of my arm. And that gap actually kind of shows you that it's a pretty long tendon because this muscle is still inserting onto my forearm, right? Like it's going to run from, uh, you know, my shoulder here and it's going to run all the way down and then it's going to grab uh, on the other side of this joint. And that's how, you know, when it pulls it, 
it bends my elbow. Um, but you can see like mine is like, it's just, it's all tendon, right? Um, well, that's great if it was like, you know, if I'm trying to be kind of explosive, but it's not so great um, for, for generating like, you know, a lot of like massive internal tension. You know, you really want to have that more filled in. Um, so that's going to have a little bit to do with it. Gender differences, that's going to affect your strength, you know. Um, we see a little bit, we see much larger type 2 characteristics in men than we see in women. Uh, neurological activation, so like your nervous system uh, being able to control, you know, again, if you have like a nervous system that is used to lifting very heavy and you have motor units that are recruiting maximal amounts and also recruiting very, very explosively and quickly, um, you know, that is, uh, that's going to be a much stronger muscle. There's going to be a greater level of strength in that compared uh, with a muscle that doesn't have as many motor units. Uh, and then certain hormonal factors. We, again, kind of going back to the gender thing here, we do know that testosterone uh, results in like a greater development of, of, you know, large muscle fibers and large muscle fibers are the, the strongest muscle fibers, right? And so again, when we talk about strength, there's a lot of things to kind of consider here. You know, some of it you're given naturally and some of it you can, you can develop through like training, but, Again, the big one I want you guys to remember for um, uh, a definition here is like uh, what strength is going to be defined as. It is the amount of internal tension a muscle can generate in order to overcome an external force. Some sort of, a lot of times it's going to be, you know, gravity, right? Most of, you know, in most gym settings, the the external force you're dealing with is, is gravity, right? Um, it's a plate that you're lifting that's heavy. Um, but sometimes it can be resistance bands, right? So you're overcoming like, you know, tension. Uh, sometimes it can be like moving through water, right? So friction um, or even like a spin bike, which is also friction. So there's other types out there, but for the most part, like, yeah, gravity is kind of our, our biggest uh, factor at play here. Um, now, when we look at our muscular contractions, and we already kind of talked about this a little bit in class, but um, we've got our three main types of contractions, right? Every, every muscle, when it's moving through its ranges of motion, you've got three contractions. So if we look at my bicep here, you know, my bicep's going to bunch up when I do this, and then it's going to like lengthen when I do that, right? It's going to bunch up, and then it's going to sort of uncurl. So when it's bunching up, right, that's moving uh, my elbow, you know, that's moving my wrist sort of towards my arm here. And that bunching up action that we're seeing there is my muscle shortening, right? Uh, we're seeing the actin and the myosin proteins slide. And so like that muscle is shortening in length. Um, that is what we call a concentric muscular contraction, right? Concentric contractions are contractions that occur when your muscle is shortening. And so basically what's happening when we go back to that idea of like strength here, the muscle is generating a greater amount of internal tension than whatever resistive force it happens to be dealing with. So in my biceps, you know, that's moving uh, like this, but my triceps are exactly the opposite. If I, you know, if I contract my tricep, you know, and I go this way, that is now shortening. My, my, my tricep is shortening while my bicep is lengthening. That's how we know that biceps and triceps are antagonists to each other, right? Antagonist muscles are muscles that do opposite things. So when my bicep shortens, my tricep lengthens. When my tricep shortens, my bicep lengthens. They are opposites of each other. And that's what we're seeing in like that arrangement. That's how, you know, we are able to move in, in all of the directions that we move in. Um, because your muscles can only shorten, you know, muscles can only pull. Uh, and then they can relax back to, to their regular length. But sorry, I need to sneeze. <laughs> I need a light. <laughs> um, well, actually, you know what? Maybe it'll go away. Um, so concentric contractions are, are shortening. Eccentric contractions are lengthening, right? And so uh, you've got this arrangement of agonist versus antagonist that's allowing us to, to move in all directions. Otherwise, if you, you know, uh, if you didn't have like an antagonist, you would like squeeze a muscle and then you'd be stuck that way, <laughs> you know, or at least like, you know, you would relax and then you're, you know, you would just like fall back rather than like moving back intentionally. So concentric contractions, like I said, the muscle is generating greater internal force. It's a shortening reaction. Uh, we can also think of concentric actions as force production. So you're generating force. 
um, rather than like reducing it, right? So if I wanted to like accelerate something, let's say I wanted to throw something really far, right? I would concentrically shorten a bunch of muscles so that I can accelerate um, and produce force you know, onto that object that I'm trying to throw, right? So that's a production movement. Uh, and, you know, like I've mentioned before, when we are writing tempo inside of a workout, so like if we, you know, we pull up an OPT example here uh, and we look at like, here's a hypertrophy, you know, workout here. Um, when we look at that and we're telling our clients, you know, what tempo do we want them to move at? Um, you know, usually we're going to describe it, you know, we, we give it these, these numbers here. The first number is always the eccentric portion of the lift. The middle number is always the isometric portion of the lift. And the concentric is always the, the last uh, number listed there. And that's the, the concentric portion of the lift there. So, you know, we can see it's the two here at the end in a two zero two tempo, or it's the one here at the end uh, in a four two one tempo. So when we're listing concentric, we're telling someone how long we want their concentric contraction to be, it's the final number that we put on there, right? And so, you know, if you think about like doing a shoulder press, right? So let's say I've got dumbbells in hand, right? And I'm pressing them straight up overhead. The concentric portion of the lift, I'm shortening my deltoid muscles as I push those dumbbells straight up, right? And so that pushing action right there uh, is the concentric portion. So I generate force, I produce force going straight up. And then I would lengthen on the way down as I, you know, reduce force. That's going to be our eccentric contraction. Now, obviously, uh, you know, I'm just body weight pantomiming here, but we look at this joint action, right? This joint action is a shoulder press. Well, what if I was holding onto a bar and I was doing a lat pull down, right? So now I've got this attached to a bar, which is going through like a cable machine, right? Well, now the concentric portion is not me going up. The concentric portion is me pulling down, right? And then the eccentric portion is me relaxing. And so that's what we're seeing uh, in our contractions there. So, you know, this is responsible for most, you know, a lot of, you know, most movement in the body, it, it starts with concentric action, you know? Um, <clears throat> and so in resistance training, it's obviously very important for us to train for concentric action, but the thing is, it's not the only type of contractions that our muscles make. And if you are looking at like muscular growth, so if your goal is like bodybuilding and you're trying to get big, concentric contractions are actually only a small part of the equation. Um, the eccentric contractions are actually uh, responsible for triggering a lot of muscular growth. Bodybuilders know that they need to spend time on eccentric contractions. Um, if they, you know, a lot, how many times do you see somebody in the gym where they'll do the, they'll, you know, they'll put all their effort into the concentric part and then they'll just drop it on the eccentric, <laughs> you know, you'll see them do these like big, heavy bicep curls with a like, <gasps> and then all of a sudden they'll just go, and then they'll like work really, really hard again. And then they'll just drop it. Right. Um, you know, they're skipping almost the, the eccentric portion of the lift. And, you know, we know that that eccentric portion of the lift is, is huge, right? Um, so, uh, you know, while we're looking at eccentric contractions, you know, these are, um, these are contractions that occur during lengthening. Yeah, question, what's up? So when you're talking about the bodybuilders, I've seen a lot of them when they curl, they hold a pause and then they let their muscle extract in a way to where it, I heard that uh, it does something with the muscles to build them even much more stronger in a way. Well, they'll do like a pause at the top. Do they go down very, very slowly? Yeah, they squeeze, but they let go slowly, and then they bring it back up, squeeze again, and they let go slowly. Yeah, so the squeezing part, we'll get into that in just a second. That's the isometric portion. Um, mm, we'll, we'll talk about it in just a second. Um, in terms of growth, there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that isometrics are very good for growth. Um, but the eccentric portion, that, that slow downward part, that is great for growth. Um, that is definitely highly associated with growth. So let's talk about that slowly lowering, right? Let's talk about that. Um, so those are our eccentric contractions, right? Eccentric contractions are contractions that occur when a muscle is lengthening, right? And so, uh, you know, again, going back to my bicep, right? It's all bunched up right now. If I unbunch it, right? I'm lengthening it out. That's the eccentric contraction, okay? 
so your muscle is generating less tension than a resistive force. So if I'm holding 20 pounds in my, my arm and I generate 19 pounds, which is less, right? Well, the, the weight's going to win. And so my arm's going to lower, right? Um, so it is a muscle lengthening action. This is a force reduction rather than production, right? So imagine if I were catching something, you know, and I had to like slowly like lower it, um, that would be eccentric. So uh, I'll give you a really good example of, of uh, what I used to think. Hey, this would happen to me all the time. Um, my dad would do this constantly. Uh, he's, a, he's a real goofball and kind of a prankster. And, uh, you know, my dad's a furniture mover, and I used to work with him at the moving company. And, uh, you know, because he was like the main, main guy, his job was either to load stuff and also to be mainly the guy who gets up top on the ladder and brings stuff down. So that's usually like the lead guy is in charge of like the actual loading to make sure it's like clean because it's his truck, you know? And if you load it poorly and it falls on someone, you know? Uh, and, and so, you know, he would be up on a ladder and he would like do this bit and I would fall for it every time where he'd start cursing and screaming and he'd get all mad uh, and be like some a-hole loaded something heavy up top. Because one of the other things about like moving stuff is because you are up on that ladder it's kind of unstable it's kind of dangerous and you're handing stuff down to people you want the light stuff up top you want the heavy stuff down below to be your base also you wouldn't put heavy stuff up because it'll crush the stuff below it so you know uh but he would start screaming you know he'd go somebody put a book carton up here and book cartons are those little tiny ones that you fill with books so they get really 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 heavy um and so he would grab it and he'd be like and he would he would pull it off the loading bring it to his legs and be like oh and then he'd be like all right this is crazy heavy you ready and i'd be down there like this and i'd be like oh yeah i got it and he would go and then he'd go oh no and he would drop it and it would inevitably be like a lampshade or something like one lampshade in a box you know in there to like you know be nice and protected but i would be there and i'd freak out and i'd try to like catch this heavy box um and inevitably it would it would weigh like three pounds um but you know like uh what would happen is whenever that would happen i would always have so i'd be generating so much tension and i'd be so ready to grab this like big heavy box that it would hit my hands and then just like bounce for a second and then like you know i would be ready to reduce this force but it would be you know i would just end up like holding it there <laughs> um so because i held it there and I was like not letting it move. I wasn't reducing the force. I was just holding my arm straight. That would be very isometric, right? No change in length because I'm generating, you know, either my muscles are already at a full range of motion and they can't be concentric anymore or I'm matching the resistance. But let's, there are times where like something would be heavy and it'd be handed down. And so I would reduce that force, you know, lengthen out my muscles and then, you know, drop it to the ground and carry it off the truck. So, you know, eccentric contractions, like I said, they're the, the lengthening. So, you know, go back to that shoulder press. When I'm lowering the dumbbells down like this, that's the eccentric portion of the lift. Now, eccentric contractions, which we always put at uh, the first number when we're labeling our, our tempo, eccentric is always going to be the, the first number listed. So it, that would, this indicates that it would be a two-second eccentric and a two-second concentric. And this one here indicates that it's a four second eccentric and a one second concentric. So Cody, that's actually kind of similar to the tempo you were talking about where they go, they go really slow on the way down, right? This is kind of similar to that actually right here. So here's the thing about eccentric contractions. Okay. Eccentric contractions are highly associated with what is called DOMS or delayed onset muscle soreness okay this is that soreness that you feel you know after a workout and you know how it's like bad the day after your workout but then it's like really bad the day after the day after your workout <laughs> like day two soreness is so much worse than day one um and that is is sort of a phenomenon uh, where there's basically a massive amount of inflammation occurring in the muscles, you know, post-workout. And so we see this, this kind of gradual discomfort, this, this inflammation that takes place between, you know, 24 and 48 hours after your workout. And we know that DOMS is heavily associated with eccentric contractions. So, you know, the longer that your eccentric contraction is, 
the more effort you're putting into that eccentric contraction, the more likely you are to be very, very sore, um, you know, the next day or maybe 48 hours after. And those are very associated um, with hypertrophy, you know, muscular growth, right? Um, and so when we see like, that's why they're so popular amongst bodybuilders. Bodybuilders really like those long eccentric contractions because it results in a lot of inflammation and that inflammation sort of translates to muscular growth. Now, does it make you stronger? Yeah, a little, but it's not necessarily the best way to gain strength. It's the best way to gain size. It's not the best way to gain endurance. It's the best way to gain size, right? So it's it's something that is very you know specific um, to our bodybuilders. But we do like long eccentric contractions for any of our clients because what's nice about going nice and slow on those eccentric contractions, one of the other benefits is that it actually puts a lot of pressure on your connective tissue particularly your tendons and your ligaments. So by putting a lot of pressure on connective tissue, you're actually driving blood flow to those areas, your tendons and your ligaments. Um, and by driving blood flow into those areas, you're delivering nutrients. And if you're delivering nutrients, you're repairing those things. So that's actually why when you look at like beginning clients, we will start them on this four to one tempo. You know, we go four seconds on the eccentric, we do two seconds isometric, we do one second concentric. And that's a really, really great way for us to make sure that like our new clients are strengthening their connective tissue while they're also growing muscle. Because if you grow your muscles like crazy, you might pull your connective tissue and, and get an injury, right? What's up, question? Yeah, so if you're saying that helps with size, then what can you do with putting that with helping increase the size but with strength and endurance. So that's where we have to do things in like a cycle, right? I mean, you're really not, you know, if you're trying to do too many things at once, you're, you're kind of a jack of all trades, master of none, right? Um, that's why we have what's called periodization where we, we, you know, we do these cycles where maybe we do focus a lot on size for a little bit and then we translate that size into strength and then we translate that strength into endurance, you know? And then we kind of reset the cycle and, and do it over and over and over again. Um, and that's, we're going to kind of look at, well, we'll, there's a little bit of uh, periodization down here at the bottom of today's lesson, actually. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something to consider. Uh, and then lastly, we have our, our third type of contractions, which are isometric. Um, isometric contractions are occurring when your muscle is not changing in length, right? Your muscle is basically frozen in a position, right? So if I, you know, if I go into like a, a little tiny like half squat and I just hold myself right here, I am in an isometric position, right? Or even just like holding my leg up, right? That's an isometric position. So, you know, my muscle is not changing any length. It's not shorting. It's not lengthening. Um, it is generating an equal amount of tension to whatever resistive force um, I happen to be applying it to, right? Now, this is another really important type of contraction, depending on what your goals are. Now, for the most part, isometric contractions don't really have much to do with muscular growth. They don't, they don't really result, like you're not going to make your legs bigger by doing like a wall sit. You're not really going to grow your abs by doing planks. Um, I love wall sits. I love planks. They are both amazing exercises, but they're not used for muscular growth. Um, what they are really good at is teaching your muscles how to hold and stabilize in a specific position. And so like, that's actually a really good trait to have, you know? Um, in fact, I actually don't do enough of this or at least haven't. Um, and so like a really good example of this, uh, Charlie, I know you've heard me talk about this before. Uh, cause I always talk about this, but you know, when you look at like, um, my posture. I have kind of a bad habit of being sort of a butt tucker. Um, and so like my butt likes to kind of scoop under. I like, I have the, what's called a posterior pelvic rotation. And so rather than my pelvis sitting neutral, which is actually doing a pretty good job of right now, uh, <laughs> um, it often sits like this. And sometimes you'll see people with like Instagram booty where it sits like that, right? So you see like anterior rotation, posterior rotation. We want to be right in the middle, right? Um, and what causes a posterior rotation? Well, that's some muscles in the front that are pulling up, and that's some muscles in the back, which are the hamstrings, that are pulling down. 
So, you know, think about like a steering wheel, right? If you had a steering wheel and you had it held like this, if I pulled down with this hand, I pulled up with this hand, it would rotate the steering wheel this way. And if I did the opposite, it would rotate it that way. So in clients who have this like Instagram booty, like excessive low back arching, their hip flexors are pulling down in the front and their low back is pulling up in the back, right? So hip flexors, low back. And so it's rotating anteriorly versus like me, I have my hamstrings pulling down in the back and actually my abdominals pulling up in the front. So, you know, we always talk about like having like a strong core. Um, and so like we, we, you know, we're always putting all this emphasis on having a strong core and it is, it's, it's exceptionally important to make sure that you have a strong core. Um, but you can end up with bad habits like me. Um, you know, uh, I, I've taught a lot of group exercise classes over my years. And a lot of that involves like a lot of crunching motions and like, you know, maybe not enough, like in my own time, stretching of those abdominal muscles to make sure they didn't get like overactive. And so now the cruncher muscles in my abs are kind of pulling me forward, right? Or if they can't, and if they can't pull me forward, what they'll do is they'll pull my pelvis upwards. And so I get that butt tuck, right? Um, so, you know, that's a, that's a concentric contraction. So now I have this problem when I am trying to stabilize my core and I'm trying to like hold myself in place, I'll even like crunch a little bit and I'll move as if I'm doing like a sit up. And that's not really what we want. What we want instead of, we just want to hold my, I just want to hold our spine in place. Right. And so you've got two different parts of your abs. You've got the part that crunches and you've got the part that stabilizes. And my stabilizing system is weaker than my crunching system. And now there's an imbalance. And that's something that, you know, you have to put, I have to put effort into like working on. Um, and so like, you know, isometric contractions are incredibly important because you look at like, you know, moving your spine very, very often, uh, but not stabilizing your spine. That's how you end up like, you know, herniating a disc or, or moving when your disc's out of place in the wrong way. And you end up with like really severe low back problems or, you know, really severe um, uh, spinal problems in general. And, and the same thing is true. Like we look at like the, the ankle, the same thing is true. If we look at the knee, the same thing is true. If we look at the hips, you know, the shoulders, all that stuff. If we get too good at moving stuff, but we don't get good enough at stabilizing stuff, um, you know, that's, that's not awesome, right? That's, that's like uh, uh, trying to hold one of your joints in place. We get these big muscles that are ripping it in one direction. So then maybe your connective tissue can't really hold on and stabilize. That's where isometric contractions come in. Isometric contractions are often the muscles that are really responsible. For, they're surrounding your joints. They're not there to, 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 you know, do these big movements. They're there to just hold everything in place, right? Um, your transverse abdominis, right? Those inner ab muscles that hold your discs in place uh, are incredibly, incredibly, incredibly important. And that's why we do really love the plank. You know, the plank is one of our favorites are side planks or bird dogs or, you know, McGill sit-ups. Um, all those things that like stabilize your spine, those are our isometric contractions. So again, you can see with beginner clients, we put a big emphasis here, right? We put a big emphasis on, isometric contractions, we give it a two second pause. So now if we look at a four, two, one tempo for a beginner client, let's say I'd probably do something unstable. Let's say it's like a single leg squat touchdown, right? So I'd stand on one leg, right? Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring my left hand to my right foot and I would keep my eyes forward as I squat and I'm gonna go down for four, hold for two and up for one. So it'll look like this. It'll be like one, two, three, four, one, two, one, right? And that type of squat, you'll notice like, you know, while I was doing, my knee was tracking, like all those little tiny micro movements, you know, that's my body trying to figure out what type of isometric con contraction it needs to hold it in place. But I'm also going down nice and slow. So I'm teaching my brain and my nervous system what a good path is and like what the, what the squat really should look like. You know, if I were a brand new client, I were just doing regular old squats, right? Let's say I was just doing like a body weight squat, right? Maybe I just put my hands here like this. I'm just going one, two, three, four, one, two, 
one, right? That's a great way for me to learn how to do it. It's a great way for me to give enough time for my client to, to, to memorize the body position and hold it, you know, has a really, you know, positive effect. Now, if I were a bodybuilder, it's a very different type of strength, right? If I'm going for muscular size, well, NASM believes that you're best going to achieve that doing an equal split concentric and eccentric. So instead, bodybuilders, according to NASM, should use a tempo like this. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, and just keep moving at a general pace. I'm not really taking a pause at the bottom or at the top because like that pausing isn't really helping with my muscular growth. So I'm just sort of moving in a general normal tempo, right? Uh, now, NASM, that's NASM's approach to hypertrophy. Um, ACSM, NASM's biggest competitor, they actually are a really big fan of a 3-1-1 tempo when it comes to hypertrophy. So that would be like sort of what we talked about with the, Cody, you were talking about with the bodybuilders earlier with that slow eccentric. They go one, two, three, they bring it up. One, yeah. two, three, and they bring it up. Um, now, which is better? I don't know. I don't really know how to answer that. Um, I think that they're both really good. Obviously, I'm pro NASM because that's who you know, ensures that I have a paycheck. Uh, but uh, I think ACSM is a really good company. I think they have a lot of very good scientific research on their side. So maybe you do eight weeks of bodybuilding and maybe you do the exact same routine for all eight weeks. And normally you hear me say, whoa, 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 eight weeks is a long time to do the same routine. You should be changing up every four to six weeks. But maybe the only change you make, you do the exact same routine, same reps, same exercises, same sets. But then all the, the only thing you change is the tempo. You do four weeks of two zero two tempo. You do another four weeks of three one one tempo. That could be the stimulus necessary that you know actually changes things up just enough, and you got to lift the same way for for eight weeks um, without changing your program too much. So you know it's a very simple program that would be easy for a client to follow. So which one's better? I, I don't know. You know I do know. Here's what I will say. Here's what I do know. This. 202 tempo is the one you need to have memorized because you are here to pass the NASM exam. <laughs> um, but you can keep the 311 in your head as a piece of trivia. <laughs> and once you graduate, then you can play around with it. <laughs> um, do you guys have any questions uh, before we move on to talking about like measuring measuring strength? All right. So uh, how do we measure strength? Lots of different ways. <laughs> Um, one of the cool ones I, I think is kind of fun is what's called a, a cable tensiometer. Um, you're not going to see this in most gyms, <laughs> um, but this is kind of cool. It can actually tell you uh, how much isometric tension you can generate, which is fun. Um, we have di uh, dyna, <laughs> it's so hard to say, dynamometers, uh, which are little grip testers. Um, they can actually test like how much you can squeeze. Um, and by the way, grip strength is one of our, our direct indicators of health, actually. Um, we don't really 100% know why, but we do know that like there is a straight up direct correlation between living long and having good grip, <laughs> uh, which is kind of fun. Um, so cable dy uh, or, or dynamometers are, are kind of a cool little instrument. Um, but and my dynamometer picture is on my one rep max picture. That's not supposed to be like that. Hold on. <laughs> um, sorry, that's just gonna that's gonna bug me. Uh, delete that picture. All right. Uh, <laughs> then we have uh, one rep max testing, and this is usually the one that we are gonna use. So uh, we are going to work at a percentage of our one rep max when we're prescribing exercise, right? So your one rep max is a measurement of your maximal weight you can lift in a single repetition, right? Uh, it's a really great tool for, for making sure that we as trainers are applying that progressive overload we talked about last night. And we talked about the principle of overload, right? Uh, and the idea that like you have to work at intensities that are high enough to trigger you know, muscular growth, right? Or, or strength or whatever. Um, so how do you make sure that you're working hard enough? Well, you can work at a certain percentage of your one rep max. It's a really, really great tool. And so typically we'll assign, um, you know, different rep ranges depending on what your rep, rep max is. So if we look at like percent of one RM, uh, you can see a little, looking for a little chart here. Yeah. 
actually, you know what? This is actually even easier. <laughs> All right, so you can see um, when you look at like, uh, wait, what? No, 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 no. <laughs> Those numbers are all wrong. <laughs> um, yeah. All right, we'll go back to the first chart. All right, so if you look at this chart here, um, you can see, uh, you know, if you did one rep of something, that is 100% of your one rep max, which means, and we're just going to use the, the number 100 because that'll make the math easy. So if your one rep max is 100 pounds, that means that you can lift 100 pounds one time, right? But let's say you want to lift uh, at 85% of your one rep max. Well, that's going to correspond with about five reps in general. You can see like 86% is sort of the perfect like five rep max. Um, so, you know, somewhere between five and six reps is going to work really well if you are lifting at 85% of your one rep max. So this one to five range right here is everywhere from 85 to 100% of your maximum intensity, um, which means that like, you know, you're, you're lifting real heavy, you're doing good, right? That's a, that's a great way to gain strength. Um, if you're going for size, we know that like you need to give your body a little bit more time to build up some lactic acid and get into that glycolytic energy system. Uh, instead of that phosphagen system. So now we might lift somewhere between six and 12 reps, which means we're gonna lift somewhere between 83 and 71% of your one rep max. NASM is gonna use slightly different numbers. NASM is gonna say 75 to 85% because they're just rounding to make it easier for you. Um, 75 to 85 is the number we need to have memorized. But you can see this chart is you know, a little bit different. Uh, and if you were lifting, you know, 60% of your one rep max, you might get all the way up to, you know, 20 repetitions. Um, so between like uh, 60 and 70%, uh, uh, that would be like, you know, somewhere between 12 and 20 repetitions, right? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that is, um, so that's, that's kind of a funny thing there. Um, when we look at our reps, awesome. Um, so, uh, looking at making sure that we know what a percentage of one rep max is, right? Um, your percentage of one rep max, uh, is, um, how we are going to assign the right intensities. Uh, and by making sure that we're the right intensities, we are going to target the right length of time while we're lifting. And so because we're on the right length of time while we're lifting, we are going to be targeting the right energy system. So we know that the ATP-PC system is really good for max strength gains. We know that glycolysis is really good for size gains and, and athletic gains. And we know that uh, our, our oxidative system is really good for endurance gains. So then we know that that means, you know, um, up to 10 seconds for the ATP-PC system. We know that that's 20 to 50 seconds for glycolysis. And we know that that's, you know, two minutes or greater uh, for oxidative. So now going back, we got to make sure that we can do the right number of reps associated with that. So we go to this chart, all that, I, all that stuff I just said translates to, you know, 85 to hundred percent of our one rep max. If we are targeting the ATP PC system, 75 to 85% of our one rep max, if we're targeting glycolysis and 70% uh, or below, if we're targeting, um, uh, if we are targeting um, uh, and uh, oxidative metabolism. So uh, does that does that start to kind of all come together, guys? Start to see how that all sort of applies? Yeah. Cool. All right. So um, now let's look at the different types of training that are out there. So these are different methods. You know, yeah, what's 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 best, right? Like what's the best way to train? I, again, we don't really like that term, <laughs> best. They're all different. They're all used for different things. So, you know, let's look at the idea of like isometric and training, right? Isometric training, um, you know, you guys all, I'm sure you all did it when you're playing sports. Um, we have to do your, you know, your coach makes you do wall sits, you know? <laughs> um, that's a great example of isometric training. When you're doing planks, that's isometric training. So this is training that involves sustained contractions of a particular muscle um, over like a, sp a specific period of time. Isometric training is really, really great if your goal is to develop stabilization. 
you know, when you think of like yoga, yoga is a really great example of like isometric training, right? Um, that's a great way to ensure that like you are keeping your joints healthy, keeping your connective tissue healthy. Uh, and it's why you see so many like professional athletes participate in like yoga on the side, like so many basketball players, so many baseball players, so many football players do like a lot of yoga because it's these, these really long sustained contractions and it's all about recovery, right? It's not necessarily helping like an NFL lineman be more explosive off the line directly, but it is ensuring that like they're less likely to get injured in the, uh, during the season or during the off season. And then it also ensures that like they're able to come back from an injury faster. Um, their joints are less likely to get, you know, hurt. So guess what? You know, that kind of does result in explosiveness, you know, in a roundabout way. And that's where, you know, that's where stuff like this really does get complicated. This is why, you know, exercise and nutrition are so complicated because like, if you asked me, you know, uh, should I do yoga? That's got a million different answers to it. It's like, well, it's really good for this. It's really good for this. What are your goals? You know, like, what is it that you're trying to achieve? A lot of people need more isometric stabilization. You know, um, Charlie said, you're going to go to the park and do bear crawls today. Right. Um, those bear crawls, right. That's like a lot of like body weight range of motion. You know, what you don't really realize when you're doing stuff like that is like, I'll bet your scapula is doing a lot of like isometric contraction, holding itself in place while you're moving these other peripheral joints around. Um, and that's why a lot of calisthenics are so good for us. You know, that's a great way to strengthen your connective tissue and bulletproof your body. Um, or look at like, you know, Cody, we're talking about like ankle stuff, right? Um, so we look at like, you know, standing on one leg, you know, um, and then maybe I've got a medicine ball in hand. So I'm moving, but my ankle is learning how to hold itself in one position and isometrically stabilize. So now I'm teaching my brain how to better control my ankle and I'm teaching my ankle, you know, I'm developing isometric strength. So that, you know, maybe I do roll my ankle at some point while I'm walking, maybe I'm walking through a grocery store and there's a banana peel on the ground, you know, like, and I roll my ankle like this. Well, luckily with isometric stabilization, I can stand on the side of my ankle and it's really not going to injure me because like I've taught my body how to control that type of contraction. We do the same thing in the core. We do the same thing in the knees, the hips. You know, every major joint in the body needs to have lots of isometric stabilization. So we do like isometric training, even if it doesn't result in an increase in my one rep max, or if it doesn't result in hypertrophy, it still has a very important purpose. And that's, you know, why we need to make sure that we are cycling through different types of workouts throughout the year. Now, I will say, do not commit to doing like a full isometric routine that would be very silly. You know, um, if you're just like, I'm going to do isometric squats and isometric this and isometric that, and you know, I'm going to hold push-up positions. Um, that's, that's not going to help you really get anywhere. Um, <clears throat> but ensuring that like you're taking time to do your isometrics rather than just like where you see people in the gym and they do those lifts or they're like, Ugh! and then they just, you know, drop it down they do the next one. Right. Like, and they just spend the whole time moving you know, there's a lot to be served by, by learning how to hold your body in the position it's supposed to be in. Um, so that's a concept of, of strength training. Another concept that's important is uh, <clears throat> this idea of pres uh, progressive resistance exercise, right? So that is a method of increasing the ability of your muscles to generate force. So progressive resistance exercise um, is where we are progressing workout to workout to workout to workout, right? So like I said, this week, uh, you know, tomorrow I've got to do um, another like three rep uh, workout. And I'm going to try to make sure that all my lifts, my, you know, hopefully my upper body lifts go up by five pounds. Hopefully my lower body lifts go up by 10 pounds. Uh, and that's what I'm going to try to like hit tomorrow. Um, that's me trying to maintain a specific amount of linear progress. Now, here's the thing. Your body is not actually like linear in terms of how it progresses. That's, that's one thing we all just need to accept. You know, I could say, well, every time I go into the gym, I'm going to add five pounds to my upper body lifts. And I'm always going to add 10 pounds to my lower body lifts. Um, if I expect to hit that every single time, I'm going to be incredibly disappointed. <laughs> um, but it's something to aim for. So I could still try to do it every time, even if it means going to failure. And that's where, you know, that final set little push comes. Um, 
Not that you have to take your body to failure every single workout. That's not really our goal. Um, but you used to get, you know, you do get somewhat close to it and you make sure that you are progressing. This is why I am such a huge freaking fan of workout logs. Write your workouts down track your numbers so that you can see progress you know um chart them you know we want to see like strength increase and then like if you see a dip you're like okay great what did i do this week that caused it to dip so massively you know um and it's like oh it's that day where i didn't get enough sleep you know <laughs> um which is almost always the answer uh <laughs> So progressive resistance training, uh, when it's done correctly, it's safe, it's beneficial, your muscles get larger, they get stronger, and they get better endurance, you know? Um, maybe you keep the weight the same and you try to do more repetitions. That's a great way to build endurance. Uh, or, you know, you go up with the weight, uh, or maybe you increase your time and attention. There's a million different things, different ways to progress. Maybe it doesn't involve progressing the weight at all. Maybe you leave the weight alone, maybe you leave the reps alone, but now you stand on something squishy. Right. And so you did the exercise in a stable environment. Now you have to do it in an unstable environment. Right. All of those things are different types of like progress. Um, we've also got variable resistance training. Uh, variable resistance training is really fun. Uh, it's on, you know, a lot of times you'll do this on like a special machine that will actually. Um, give you a different amount of tension depending on what range of motion you happen to be in. So like, you know, you might get more tension the further away you are or less tension. Um, that's variable resistance training. Um, generally you need like special machines to do that, but there are examples of variable resistance training that everyone has access to. Resistance bands are an example of variable resistance training. Think about like, you know, resistance bands are rubber band, right? So the further, that rubber band is stretched out, the more it's pulling back this way. So as you're pulling through a full range of motion, it's gentle and then it gets harder and harder and harder and harder and harder as you're pulling through a deeper range of motion. That is technically variable resistance training because the tension is changing. It's not just 20 pounds through the whole thing, right? It's, it's 20 pounds that's maybe increasing to possibly 30 pounds towards the end of the range of motion. Um, you'll also see things like, um, you'll also see, uh, you know, putting bands, um, on like a resistance, uh, on like a bench press or, or a barbell squat or something. So you can see here, um, he's putting a band, he's tying it to the floor, um, or he's tying it to a weight probably. Well, actually, here's here's doing the opposite. He's actually going, you know, this, these bands are going up. So that would actually take tension off. The higher you go up, the easier the exercise would get. So that if, you know, what he's trying to do here is he's trying to, you know, help, help somebody have like a stronger pull off the ground. So they're learning how to like, this is a great way to like learn how to like work on your pull. Um, but the weight is going to get lighter. Um, I'm sorry, it's going to get heavier as, uh, as she goes up. Right. Um, so, uh, that version there, or like if it were a deadlift, you would tie it in the opposite direction, or I'm sorry, ugh, I'm getting old, turn around. If it were a barbell squat, you would flip it the other way around, um, and tie it to the floor. So, you know, it gets heavier, the further away you get, or you'll see some people do these with chains. Um, You'll see these like this chain thing every now and then. Um, there we go, Alan Thrall. This guy's a really famous power lifter. So he's got these chains here. The weight gets heavier the further he pulls away from the floor. And that's a great way, like if you're really trying to remember how, you know, if you are trying to remember or teach your body how to continue driving force as you go up, that's gonna help you in your end range of motion. God, that's a lot of weight with those freaking chains. Um, so that's kind of a fun type of lifting as well, right? It gets heavier the more chains that are on there. Um, and that's variable resistance training. I'll be honest, I haven't really goofed around with variable resistance training. This is not something I have a lot of experience with, um, but it's out there. <laughs> I haven't done a lot of research on it personally. This is definitely, that's definitely not my forte. Sometimes that variable stuff, like I get the concept of it where I'm like, that's great because yeah like your change your range of motion changes and stuff um but i 
I don't. I mean, I, I can I can kind of see the appeal, but I'm not. I'm, I don't know. To me, it seems like a lot of effort for something that's. I don't know. I, I just can't imagine having that big of a change. Um, I will say it's more of a powerlifting thing. It's definitely a strength thing more than anything else. Um, so if you do want to know about it, I would say Mo is the guy to ask. Mo is, you know, he's the strong man <laughs> in the PFT program. Um, all right, let's go ahead and look at isokinetic training. Uh, this is another one that's kind of special. Uh, you're not going to really find this in a lot of gyms, uh, but this actually uses a very special machine that keeps you at a very consistent pace while you're lifting. Uh, a lot of physical therapists will use these pieces of equipment to help their clients um, with those isometric types of contractions. So see isokinetic uh, training, and they'll use these machines that will control how fast uh, you can move through a different range of motion. So you can see here, he's going to perform like a quadricep extension and this machine's going to kind of control how fast he's able to move. If it ever goes, God, <laughs> oh, I missed it. Killing me, Smalls. Just absolutely murdering me, Internet. Come on. <laughs> there we go. So it's a good way to, like, train uh, your nervous system. If you have somebody who's, like, coming back from a really, really, really severe injury, this can be a good way to teach them, you know, how to develop, like, that tension and, like, the right speed to do things. Um, the other benefit to these, the other benefit to isokinetic training, um, cause it can only move so fast, right? Like you could try being as explosive as possible and you could try moving super quickly and it'll be like moving through sludge. The isokinetic machine will slow you down no matter how hard you are pressing. Um, and that's really great to get you back after like a surgery or something like that. Um, but I don't know. That's another one that like, you know, it's very specialized. I don't know how it is that much better than regular training. <laughs> um, me personally, I think that like you can get a lot out of regular gym stuff if you do it correctly. Um, then we've got plyometric training. Uh, this is always a fun one. Um, so plyometric training is very explosive movements, right? If you're trying to teach your muscles how to generate force very rapidly, if we're focusing on like rate of force production, plyometric training is great at that. So this is going to enhance uh, your strength and your power, and it's going to do it through what we call myotactic uh, stretch reflexes, right? Um, so myotactic stretch reflex is, you know, when you're nervous, your nervous system is designed to protect your muscles, right? Um, so when you rapidly stretch a muscle, this protecting mechanism kind of kicks in where your body goes, whoa, you just stretched out the rubber band really quickly. So then it contracts back in the opposite direction. Um, so we actually take advantage of that and then we contract at the same time. That gives us explosive. And that's why, you know, if you do something like this, right, this creates a big stretch, this creates a big explosion. Um, same thing is true on a jump. You do like a depth jump, you start on top of a box jump down, that rapidly stretches you, and then you jump out of it at the bottom, that can be a great way to teach your body to be more explosive. So if you're going for like power, uh, plyometric training is a really, really great tool at your disposal. If you're an athlete, um, that's why you see so many athletes doing like medicine ball throws and squat jumps and thing, kettlebell swings and things like that. Um, there's an inherent neuromuscular response there to prevent you from getting injured in the form of your stretch reflex. And we've taken that, uh, that, you know, protection from injury response, and we've turned it into a way to make us more athletic, which is kind of cool. So you can see that here, right? He's going to start on the ground. He's going to jump up. When he lands, these muscles are all going to get stretched. And so then he's going to jump again. And then like, he's going to, so he's going to shorten out of that stretching. He's eccentrically lengthening. So then he rapidly concentrically shortens that causes him to rapidly eccentrically lengthen again. And then he concentrically shortens again, right? So jumping twice, right? Um, and that type of jumping is it gives, it helps develop like, you know, power. 
Um, if you're trying to train your nervous system to be very explosive, that's a really great way to do it. So we love plyometrics. Plyometrics are fun. And a lot of times plyometrics are, you know, the, the difference between, you know, being a, the, the best athlete on the, on the court or on the field. Right. Um, now, uh, like we said, like I talked about, um, periodization, this is another concept that's very important when it comes to strength, because you do not want your body to get too used to things. You want your body to continually overload. And that's where this periodization comes in. Right. And so the aim of periodization is to, uh, lower your training, uh, at different periods of time by increasing intensity and vice versa. So you're actually like moving your intensities around moving your timing around, uh, and you're varying those things that's going to shorten your recovery time, uh, and the time necessary between like specific, like different types of training. Right. So we look at periodization. Uh, let me see if I can find like a NASA one. I can find a good example here. Um, there we go. So you take a look right here. Um, this is an example of like what, this is an annual program for definitely like an athlete. Uh, and so here is where, you know, in January, this is like in season, right? This would be like an athlete who's in the middle of their season. Our goal for an athlete who's in season is not necessarily to increase their strength, right? Our goal is just to keep them playing their sport. Our goal of the off season or the preseason that's where we're trying to increase their strength. So you can see in season, we're really mainly focusing on just corrective exercise and stabilization, right? All those isometric contractions and stuff. Maybe they get a little bit of max strength here, right? Where they just, just to maintain their strength throughout the season, but it's nothing like super intense. So, you know, if they were doing like several workouts per week, we got a little bit of max strength in there, a little bit of endurance and a lot of corrective exercise. Then next month we take that strength and we try to, you know, increase their endurance with it. So it's like their, their lifts may be increased just a little bit. And so now we're going to focus on making sure that we keep that endurance, right? So now again, more corrective exercise, more stabilization and a little bit of endurance strength there. And then we just zigzag back and forth between that all season right? So uh, strength, endurance, strength, endurance. Meanwhile, doing a lot of corrective exercise. And then you can see our first month of the off season in May, uh, we do just corrective and stabilization. It's the end of the season. They've worked really, really, really hard. They're going to be beat up. Hopefully they went to the playoffs um, or, you know, the, the finals of whatever sport it is that they're playing. And so because of that, you know, we definitely want to make sure that like, you know, they've been playing all year give them a month to really just kind of reset the body and take it easy. Then we are off season, you know, pre-season trying to gain strength, right? We're trying to increase their athleticism. And this is where you can see like, we're skipping the corrective exercise. The corrective exercise isn't part of it. We've already got stabilization. We did that in the beginning of our off season here. Now we're going for endurance, we're going for maximum strength, or we're going for endurance and we're going for power, right? For the next two months, lots of strength, lots of power. This is the most intense part of their training over the year. And then right before the preseason starts, we're doing a combination of endurance, strength, and stabilization. We're putting them all together. Um, and the idea there, so you would have like a workout on Monday that would be like maybe like a, a, a squat where you're on top of the BOSU ball, right? That squishy little ball and you're having a hard time stabilizing. And then Wednesday you do more squats, but this time it's like real heavy. And then Friday you do more squats, but it's super light and explosive. So you do squat jumps, right? And so like that would be, you know, that's our peak training right there. We're trying to get them to peak right before their preseason starts so they can work as hard as possible into the preseason going into, you know, the season for their, for their sport. Um, then First part of the preseason, again, we're going right back to that kind of similar scheme that we saw, corrective, stabilization, endurance for two months, and then corrective, stabilization, a little bit of max strength, corrective, stabilization, endurance, and then the cycle repeats, right? So that'd be January through December there. I don't know what type of athlete this is. I'm assuming this is like, it's a lot of endurance. So I don't know, maybe soccer, maybe baseball. Um, although if it were baseball, we'd play playing in the fall. I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that's probably soccer, I think. I don't really know what soccer seasons are. 
Um, so that's an example of periodization. Now you don't always have to do like multiple phases in a row like that. You could do that's that's very much what we call undulating periodization, where it's making like these big waves um, every week. You could also keep it very simple and make it look something like this. Um, oh, please give me a high quality version of this picture. <laughs> um, there we go. So you could also do something like this, where, you know, in January, you do stabilization. In February, you do all endurance. In March, you do hypertrophy. April, you go back to endurance. May, you do hypertrophy again. Uh, June, you're doing max strength. And then you do a big reset. Um, and this is this would be like a bodybuilder, right? This would be, or maybe not necessarily a bodybuilder, but maybe somebody who is like trying to just tone up. Right, so they're applying a little bit of bodybuilding and a little bit of like cutting. Um, so yeah, their goal is to build muscle masses right here, right? So stabilization, strength endurance, hypertrophy, strength endurance, hypertrophy again, maximum strength, and then stabilization to kind of reset the whole thing, right? Um, so that's a really good, you know, if your goal is to gain some muscle and lose some weight, that's that's probably a good cycle for you, you know. Um, so that's where we'd have periodization. It varies our intensity throughout the year to make sure that we never end up overtraining, but that we also never end up like getting stale and plateauing. Uh, any questions there, guys? Questions, comments, concerns? How are y'all feeling? Good. Love it. All right. Um, so let's take a look at our muscular power next. Um, so uh, looking at the idea of power, right? Because we talked a lot about like muscular strength, right? We talked about force. Um, now we got to talk a little bit about velocity, right? We got to talk about like how we're generating tension quickly. And so your muscular power is going to combine the concept of like force production and force velocity, right? And so that actually is our definition for power. So if we look at like muscular power, there's the combined factors of speed and strength, right? Um, power, power is an equation. It's power equals force times velocity. So if you can generate 100 pounds of force in five seconds, right, your total power output would be, um, you know, 100 times five, right? Um, but if you can generate, uh, you know, um, 100 pounds of force in, let's say, one second, which is five times faster, right? Uh, your power output is going to be, you know, a uh, hundred times one, uh, and that's, you know, that's going to raise your your velocity up, right? Your force remained the same, but your velocity went up. So that's going to give you a much more explosive contraction, right? Uh, and that's what you see on the field when you look at like athletes. You know, when you talk about like breaking somebody's ankles, right? Um, you know, what we're looking at, your force that you're generating is your body weight. And if I'm able to shift this way and then back this way more explosively than the other guy, then I'm going to, you know, move around this way and I'm going to be able to like get right past them. Right. Um, so I'm going to be more powerful. Um, so this is where like, yeah, max strength is great. But a lot of times we do only max strength training. You'll notice like you don't exactly move very great. Like I'm like tomorrow when I go grab that barbell to do my deadlifts, you know, like I'm coming up like real slow, even though I'm trying to move fast. So I'm, uh, I'm addressing one half of the equation, right? I'm getting, I'm working on the force part of things. Maybe next month I focus on the force and the velocity part of things, right? And that's what we're going to see there, right? This is where sometimes people will be like, I'm trying to learn how to dunk a basketball and I do squat jumps and I practice dunking all the time and I just, I can't get to the rim, right? And it's like, well, maybe you're only addressing one half of the equation. Maybe you're only working on the speed of contraction, but you're not working on the force. So bar heavy barbell squats are going to help you in your you know, goal to get to dunk a basketball. And then squat jumps are gonna be the other part of that equation, which you're already doing, which is great. You know, um, This is really similar, Charlie, this should look really familiar to you because um, we talked about like speed, right? Speed is a formula and it's your stride rate, which is like how often you're striding, that would be kind of similar to your velocity and your stride length, which is like how much, you know, if you're generating force, like taking a big step every time. Uh, you take too much of a big step, 
you're not gonna be able to generate very, you know, you're not gonna be able to step very often. So you're gonna lose velocity. So there's sort of a, a perfect middle ground to get the largest number possible, right? So another way to say this is it is your rate of force production, right? It is the rate of force production. That's our power, right? Um, so how do we develop power? Well, in order to like develop maximal power output, we've got to train for those type two explosive, you know, muscle fibers, particularly type two X muscle fibers, which are the really true type two fibers, right? So we can do heavy explosive type resistance training, right? So in training for this, this is where phase four and phase five of the OPT model really come in, max strength and power. So uh, max strength, obviously very good for the force side of the equation. Power, obviously very good for the velocity side of the equation. Uh, and what that's going to do, we are going to be training our type 2x muscle fibers. We are going to develop power because the physiologic changes that will take place in the body, we will develop more motor unit recruitment, which is really something you get super well from heavy, 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 heavy lifting. Um, remember, a motor unit is one neuron and all of the muscle cells that it's, you know, triggering, right? Um, so if we can get a neuron to contract more, you know, to trigger more cells, that's going to give us a stronger contraction. Or if we have more neurons all working together, that's also, you know, same thing. Um, so a greater number of motor units recruited will contract as many muscle fibers as possible. You are going to develop that by lifting very, 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 very heavy right? Uh, there's also going to be the idea of like rate coding. Um, rate coding is more commonly referred to as your motor unit firing rate. So it's how quickly that neuron's able to like fire over and over and over again. Um, the faster the frequency, the more powerful of a, uh, the, the stronger a contraction you're going to have. Uh, and then we also have motor unit synchronization. Training your motor units to all fire simultaneously gives you a more powerful contraction. Uh, I always like to use the analogy of like a tug of war when I'm talking about this. Imagine you've got five guys on two, you know, uh, five guys here and five guys here, and they're all tug of warring. And, you know, um, you've got red versus blue. And the blue group at the anchor, the last guy who's on there is going to say, one, two, three, pull. One, two, three, pull. One, two, three, pull. And he's going to get his team into a rhythm. And everybody on this team, for the most part, they're all relatively the same in strength. But because the blue team is a little more organized and they all give their maximum effort at the exact same time, they're probably going to win that tug of war. So what they'll do is they'll all pull at the same time and then they'll all reset at the same time. They'll all pull, they'll all reset, they'll all pull. Rather than the second group, which is like maybe <clears throat> As I'm pulling as hard as I can, the guy behind me is resetting. And then I need to reset my grip when I'm done. And then he's already finished resetting. So now he's pulling as hard as he can. We're canceling each other out because we're not working together, right? Um, so motor unit synchronization is another way to really get strength. If you can get your fi neurons firing at the same time, uh, you're going to have a much more powerful contraction. We get that from doing a lot of very explosive lifting uh, and also making sure that we're taking rest in between. We're taking you know, plenty of time to recover and rest before we try lifting again because your nervous system, I mean, and you guys probably know if you ever try to lift really, really heavy, you get that like quivering sensation that sometimes takes place afterwards. That's your nervous system basically just like, <sighs> it's like stressed out. It's like firing like crazy. So give that time to relax and calm down so that you can turn everything on at the same time rather than some things already be turned on while other things are turned off. You know, like we want to get everything in sync. Um, so power, we're going to get from motor unit recruitment, motor unit firing rate, and motor unit synchronization. Um, those things are going to really develop uh, our maximal strength and our maximal power. Questions on that one, guys? No. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's take a look at our neural adaptations. Or I'm sorry, that's not true. Let's take a look at our muscular adaptations. So, um, all right, let's say you start regularly participating in a strength training program. What are the adaptations? What's going to happen to your body, right? Well, this is where we're going to see neural adaptations. Um, some of the neural adaptations we're going to see, we're going to see increases in strength and power, but not necessarily size, you know? Uh, like I said, you see like a lot of Olympic powerlifters, 
They're some of the most powerful, strong people on the freaking planet. They're not that big. I mean, don't get me wrong, like they're in great shape. <laughs> like, like make no mistake, they are in excellent shape. But they don't, they're not as big as like a bodybuilder. And yet bodybuilders can't really lift as much as Olympic. So it's like, so maybe size isn't the only thing that has to do with like strength. There is a connection for sure, but it's not always a direct translation. Um, and so, you know, uh, neural adaptations that we're going to see, maybe it's an increase in strength and power. Other neural adaptations that we see that I would argue are more important uh, is we're going to see like a development of stabilization and proprioception, right? Remember, proprioception is your body's ability to understand what position it's in, like where it is in space, right? So again, like through strength training, I might develop the ability to like, you know, maybe I lose my balance for a second, but then like I can stabilize and get back to, you know, whatever position I need to get into. And that's going to keep me safe when I'm like living my life out in the world. So the closest I've ever got, I've never, I've never sprained an ankle. I've never um, really had a bad problem with that. The closest I ever, I did turn my ankle really bad one time at ultimate. Um, I was playing, I stepped in a hole uh, and I, I rolled my ankle and I was like, oh shit, here's my first, whoops. Uh, here's my first uh, ankle sprain, right? Of my whole life. Um, which is really ironic, by the way, because I've broken bones like crazy my whole life. I've, I've, I've broken 14 bones. I've broken bones 14 times, I should say. <laughs> um, but like, uh, I've definitely broken more than 14 bones. <laughs> when I was a kid, I shattered my ankle. I, I liquid, I broke my, I broke 20, I had 22 fractures in my ankle when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> but luckily as a little kid, you know, little kids are growing so quickly. Doctor was like, he'll be fine. And sure enough, like, boop. <laughs> it just all healed. Cause I was like, I think I was five or there was five or six. Um, anyway, so I twisted my ankle really badly. Right. And, uh, yeah, I was walking around on it just fine. I, I went to the, and I went to the grocery store, uh, later that day. And, um, <laughs> this is so funny. Uh, cause this is like what really like, you know, proprioception, you, your body gets used to what it's able to do. And I'm walking, I'm on my phone because I'm a millennial and I'm not paying attention even though I'm in a parking lot. And uh, <laughs> this car starts backing out and uh, they don't see me because I'm walking at an angle. I'm perfectly in their blind spot. All I have to do is like step around. Um, and sure enough, like this car gets really close to me. So then like I try to like step around it and use my ankle the way I am used to using my ankle, but it was weak. So when I stepped on it, it immediately gave out on me because my nervous system is designed to protect itself. So like when I put too much pressure on an injured tissue, my instincts without me really being aware of it were to just lift that leg back up off the ground. So then I tried to step and then it lift and I literally just tumbled straight backwards. And I was like, I'm about to get run over by this car. And, uh, you know, luckily the car saw me and it stopped. And it was this like little old lady. <laughs> she was so scared. She's like, oh, I'm so sorry. And I was like, it's fine. Trust me. I, you know, this was 100% my fault. Like you are totally fine. And she was like, ah, and she was like crying. It was all, it was awful. She was so scared. She ran me over. Cause she just like saw this person disappear, <laughs> like fall straight underneath. Like she probably saw me in the rear view mirror. And then I was just like, you know, there one second, I was like <laughs> gone the next. Um, but anyway, like that's, that's a neural thing, right? That's your nervous system um, being controlled. If, if it hadn't been injured, my nervous system would have been ready to recruit the right muscles and just very quickly and easily move me out of the way, right? So how do we get back from something like that? Once that injury occurs, how do we you know, get back to where we were? Well, we need to have some neural adaptations, not the neural adaptations that result in maximum power, the neural adaptations that focus on stability. I wanna be able to recruit the muscles in my calf, my shin, my ankle, my the bottom of my foot especially, um, my quad, my hamstring, my glutes, my adductors, my abductors, my core, all the way to my body. I need to contract all of those things and teach my body, relearn how to hold myself in place. Whether I'm in this position or this position, it does not matter. We need to learn how to hold ourselves 
in the right place. And that's where you start to do things, you know, where we land and we focus on stabilization, right? See how I'm losing my balance a little bit, right? And we go this way and we go this way, right? And we learn how to like stabilize and hold those positions. That little bit of like stability work is going to give me proprioception and that's going to teach my body how to control itself and I'm going to injury proof myself, you know? Um, and I'm never going to freaking sprain that ankle again, or I'm never going to tear that ACL again, or I'm never going to impinge my shoulder again. Right. Um, so those are some of our neural adaptations. That's why we love strength training. Strength training gives you, you know, strength and power, but also stabilization. Uh, it can also result in, you know, enlargement of muscle growth. Um, Obviously, like you are going to enlarge your muscle fibers by generating more actin and myosin proteins, your muscle fibers will grow. Your muscle fibers grow. Well, remember, those are your muscle cells. So guess what? You've got bigger muscle cells. Bigger muscle cells translates to bigger muscles. Shocker of the year, right? <laughs> so an increase in the number and size of your myofibrils, that's the actin and myosin, um, results in a larger muscle cell. Uh, we see increases in, in power, right? Uh, obviously, like generating more force production and then also like that rate of force production is going to be really important. You might have more like enzymes that allow you to produce that like ATP PC reaction, which is very explosive. It only lasts, you know, five to 10 seconds. But, you know, if you generate, you've got more of that creatine kinase in your muscle cells, you're going to be much more powerful, much more explosive, right? So, um, that's going to be really good. Also, like larger, larger does sometimes translate to more powerful. Um, uh, hyperplasia, by the way, we got two different types. We got hyperplasia, and what we're going to see. That's an increase in the number of uh, muscle cells or fibers. That happens in animals, but it's pretty rare in humans. Um, it happens in humans, but it's indirect, uh, not something from, from training. Training does not make more muscle cells. It makes your muscle cells larger. Um, hypertrophy is not an increase in the number of muscle cells. It's an increase in the size of muscle cells. Um, that's not something you're going to see come up in a test or anything, but no, just figured we mentioned it. Uh, now all this training, whether it's explosive or, or stabilization or whatever, uh, it's going to make you sore. <laughs> you know, like, um, so muscles will experience inflammation in response to the damage of exercise. Right. And so, uh, whenever we damage, uh, those muscle cells, you know, a lot of times, most of the cellular damage that we see is happening in your type two muscle fibers. It's pretty rare that we experience a lot of damage in our type one fibers. Because remember, your type one fibers are um, those endurance fibers. So they're repairing themselves really quickly. They got a lot of blood flow. So they don't get sore quite as easily. Your type two fibers, on the other hand, they absolutely do. Um, you know, uh, we see like a lot of, it, they're also much larger in size because they are larger in size. There's more cellular fluid because there's more cellular fluid. They are relying primarily on glycolysis. What's our byproduct of glycolysis? Lactic acid. So there's a lot of lactic acid buildup with type two training versus type one training where we see like, you know, that lactic acid gets burned up as fuel really quickly. Um, so it doesn't have any chance to kind of stick around. Um, so type two muscle fibers rely on glycolysis for energy production, and therefore they are burning more due to that lactic acid buildup that we experience. Uh, and then what's really fun about resistance training, you know, I know it's not the same as cardio. It's not, you know, it's not like lifting weights is going for a run, but there are cardiovascular changes. Um, we'll see what are called, you know, they're hemodynamic adaptations since you're cardiovascular stuff. So your heart rate's gonna slightly, uh, you know, get stronger due to strength training. When you're strength training, your heart rate goes up in the same way that it does during cardio, maybe not quite as high as a cardio workout, but sometimes, you know, and so like that's going to make your heart stronger, increase your stroke volume, which will lower your resting heart rate. Your heart can beat less often because of how much stronger it is, right? Um, you know, it used to be believed uh, back in the day that when you were born, you had a certain number of times your heart would beat in your life, and then that's what determined when you were going to die. You were assigned, we'll say, you know, two million beats. <laughs> and then uh, once you hit two million, that's how you died of old age. Um, that's what you people used to believe. 
Uh, luckily, that is not true. But if that were true, uh, you know, I would be, want to be the guy who whose heart beats slowly. <laughs> uh, and if it beats slowly, then, you know, I'm, I'm going to last longer. <laughs> well, how do you get your heart to beat more slowly? Well, you train it to beat more slowly. You, you, you make it stronger, right? And it'll be able to pump more blood per beat. So we'll see an increase in stroke volume, which is a really good thing. We'll see an increase in VO2 max. Your cells will get better at consuming oxygen. So you'll be able to consume more oxygen. The more you can consume, uh, the, the, the more work you can do, right? Uh, and so both those things have been shown to increase with resistance training if it's the correct type of stress. I, will, I think I put that in there. Um, if it's the correct type of stress, you can see the capital is definitely like me. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're not actually getting your heart rate elevated a little bit during your strength training, it's not going to have big adaptations for your cardiovascular system. Um, but it'll have a little bit, you know. Charlie, you're going, you know, you're doing battle ropes today. That's, you know, strength and a little bit of cardio. That's a good way to increase your strength and also get your heart rate up. So that's going to be sort of the best of both worlds. Um, and we see a decrease in cholesterol levels with strength training, which is amazing. That's one of our best things that we get, actually. Cholesterol decreases when you do strength training. Why? Well, uh, a part of this is your hormones. Um, remember, your cholesterol, they're little globules of fat, right? And there's stuff that's really dense because it's like packed full. That's the good fat, right? That's the HDL cholesterol. And then there's the low density stuff. That's your like globules that are kind of empty and it's mostly just fat. That's the stuff that blocks your arteries, right? And so What's great is like when your HDL is used to generate hormones, that HDL, that high density, good stuff, we use that to make hormones, particularly testosterone. You know, men, we, we make a lot of our testosterone thanks to our cholesterol. And so if you've got a lot of HDL, good cholesterol, and it's going around through your body, it's cleaning out, it's picking up the LDL stuff um, and eating it. You know, uh, and then it eats it and turns it into testosterone, which helps you build even more muscle. And so by triggering and doing heavy strength training in particular, it has really positive effects on our cholesterol levels. Um, so we love that, right? Any questions on that? We're going to move into flexibility uh, for our final section here. Any questions on uh, strength training stuff and why it's so awesome? I'm good. Well, cool. All right. Obviously, the reason I ask questions is, you know, if there are any questions, is because I want to know if you have questions. But it's also always a good chance for me to take a drink. Because <laughs> I often start talking so much, I'm like, <laughs> I start to lose my voice. Um, all right, let's look at the flexibility here. This is our last little bit. So flexibility, sort of a different concept, but related to how our muscle physiology works. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about this in our program design classes. We, I mean, we talk about flexibility all the time because it's such a huge part of our industry. Um, but just giving you a quick little anatomy lesson here, reminder of like what the materials inside your muscles are. So inside of your muscles, you have got what are called muscle spindles, and you've got gold, what are called Golgi tendon organs. These are what are called mechanoreceptors. They're, they're part of your muscular system uh, in the sense that they live in your muscular system, but they are actually part of your nervous system. And you, if you look at their function, like their job is to communicate between your muscular and nervous system, right? Because your nervous system controls your muscular system. So when you look at a Golgi tendon organ and a muscle spindle, actually, where did that go? That was a good one. So when you look at these, it's this little, they're these little materials right here, right? Your muscle spindles, see how they're wrapped around your muscle fibers? They're like a coil. And so when you pull muscle fibers apart, that coil is also being pulled apart. And so now your nervous system is saying, oh, okay, I get it. The muscle is lengthening, right? Or like if the coil is coming back together, muscle go, your brain goes, oh, okay, I get it. The muscle is shortening. So your muscle spindles are what's communicating with your brain. That's how your brain knows that it's, you know, how it's moving, right? Uh, meanwhile, you've also got what are called Golgi tendon organs. And you can see like they're located in this little white part. They're located in the tendon that's attaching to your muscle, your muscles to your bones, right? And so those Golgi tendon organs, they're there to send a signal to the brain saying, here's how much tension 
is in the muscle, right? So the muscle spindle says what length the muscle is. The Golgi tendon organ says how much tension there is. If tension reaches 100%, that means it's going to tear off the bone, right? So you know, we don't want to do that. Um, so, uh, and then there's also joint receptors, which we're not seeing in this picture here, but joint receptors are there. They're in the middle between your joints, like your ligaments, and they're sensing like, are you accelerating? Are you decelerating? Is there pressure? Is there a lot, a lot of pressure? Is there a little pressure? Um, they're sensing stuff that's happening in your joints. So your brain is using muscle spindles, uh, which are sensitive to changes in length and rate of length tension, uh, changes. Um, Golgi tendon organs, which are sensitive to changes in tension and rate of tension changes, and joint receptors, which are sensitive to pressure, acceleration, and deceleration of your joints, they are using these three things to understand what position your body is in. And there's a much worse picture here, but you can see there's a muscle spindle, right, throughout the belly of the muscle, and then there's your Golgi tendon organ in the tendon as it inserts onto a bone. Um, that picture sucks. Uh, <laughs> so those receptors are basically how our brain is interpreting where it is, like what position your body is in, right? Um, so again, like I know that I'm moving my arm right now, even though I can't see my arm, I know that it's happening because my brain is interpreting length changes here. So I can feel it happening. You know, and when I say that, sometimes people are like, well, yeah, you know, you're moving your arm. You're the one saying you're, you know, to move, you're the one telling it to move. Yeah, great, but how do I know it's happening? Those receptors, right? Those receptors are me getting information back, right? I can send them from, you know, I tell people to do stuff all the time and they don't do it. You know, <laughs> how do I know it actually happened? Well, I need some type of receptor. I need to ask, you know, or check, did this happen? Um, so if we know that those are some of the structures inside of our muscles and inside uh, of our nervous system, we can take advantage of those structures in order to increase our client's mobility. Because here's the thing about those muscle spindles and those Golgi tendon organs, they are liars. <laughs> um, they really like to lie to your nervous system. So what I mean by that, when I say that like your Golgi tendon organs and in your muscle spindles, when I say that they're liars, what I mean is like, remember the muscle spindle is in charge of saying what length your muscle's in, right? So if I'm sore and I go to lengthen my arm out and I start, I'm like, oh, that's sore, right? That's actually one part of that is my muscle spindle going, yeah, we're really beat up right now. And if you overstretch us too quickly, we will tear. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lie to the brain and I'm going to say that we're at full length before we are actually at full length. You know, this is like when you were a kid and you'd be like, hey, mom, can I have five dollars to go do this thing? And your mom has like a hundred bucks in her wallet, but she's like, oh, I don't have any. You know, <laughs> she's saying that to like save money so that you as a child do not spend, you know, money on nothingness. Uh, <laughs> right. It's like, oh, we're running out of money this month. And there's, you know, there's a little bit in the stash in the back, right? Um, well, your muscle spindles are actually doing kind of a similar thing. Your muscle spindles are saying, we can't possibly stretch any further. We need to stay, you know, bunched up. Um, but what's really cool is that Golgi tendon organ, it's there to sense how much tension. Now, when something reaches full length, you know, it's being pulled from end to end obviously tension is going to be really high. And if you go any further in that length, something's got to give and that muscle might tear, right? Um, but if you've got like a uh, Golgi tendon organ that they're sensing that tension, you know, they both start to freak out simultaneously. You know, um, when you start stretching, they both go, ah, we're at full length, don't stretch any further. And you feel that stretching sensation. You're like, oh God, that's stiff. Right, and that's the stretch that you're feeling when you're stretching. That is your muscle spindle telling your nervous system, like, "Hey, you better create some pain signals right now, because if this Yahoo keeps stretching any further, we're gonna rip off, we're gonna rip in half." Right, so then your brain goes, oh, "Okay, pain signals on the way," and then you feel that, like, "Wow, wow, wow," in your muscles, right? So, uh, but here's what's really cool: the Golgi tendon organ, which is like, you know, there in the tendon, sensing how much tension there is. At first, it's yelling. It's it's totally yelling with the muscle spindle. The muscle spindle is freaking out. And the Golgi tendon organ's like, uh, yeah, ah, you know, it's like screaming as well. Um, but then after about 30 seconds worth of time, that Golgi tendon organ's like, 
you know what? There's really not any tension. We're not actually gonna rip off the bone. <laughs> um, the tension's relatively low. Why, why are you freaking out? So what it does is it actually sends a signal. After 30 seconds of you know stretching, the Golgi tendon organ realizes there's no actual tension. So then it will send a signal back over to the muscle spindle and turn the muscle spindle off. And it'll be like, hey man, shut up. We're fine, <laughs> right? And that's why if you've ever noticed when you're stretching, if you hold your stretches for like a full 30 seconds, you'll notice it starts to relax. That's the Golgi tendon organ inhibiting your muscle spindle. So stretches that we hold for 30 seconds um, are what we call static stretches. And these are our slow, long duration, gentle stretches that lengthen a muscle to uh, beyond its resting position. And then we hold it anywhere from 30 seconds up to two minutes, you know, depending on how you wanna hold it. And, you know, that is taking advantage of that Golgi tendon organ inhibiting that muscle spindle. We call that autogenic inhibition, right? Autogenic inhibition is the process where if we put pressure on a Golgi tendon organ, which means, you know, we pull it from end to end, or actually you could also just massage. You could push, you know, I got a pector, pec, uh, pec tendon right here. If I push on that tendon, you know, it hurts at first. And I'm like, oh God, that's painful. But if I sit there and I hold it for 30 seconds, I can actually feel my pec squeezing because my pec's like, hey, stop. We, you know, we benched yesterday. You can knock it off. <laughs> um, oh God, that's tender. Uh, if I push on this and I hold it for like a full 30 seconds, maybe a little bit of massage, like just a little bit of back and forth motion, right? And I can already start to feel it. it's actually letting go. It's relaxing, right? And that Golgi tendon organ, which is experiencing that tension is inhibiting my muscle spindle. And now it's allowing me to get full, you know, deeper length, right? Um, so that is the process where we put pressure on one to inhibit the other. That is autogenic inhibition. And it's what we use. And that's why that autogenic inhibition is why static stretches do what they do. That's why stretching works. Uh, now we've got other types of stretches as well. Uh, we've got active isolated stretches. Active stretches are stretches where we actually perform it by moving our muscle through its full range of motion and contracting the antagonist muscle uh, for one to two seconds. And then we repeat that for maybe five to 10 repetitions. So, you know, when we contract an antagonist muscle, you know, your brain is designed when you contract your biceps, it tells your triceps to relax. When you contract your triceps, it tells your biceps to relax. So if I contract the opposite muscle, it's going to send a signal to relax the other one. If I do that over and over and over again, hopefully I'll get my muscle to relax, right? So by contracting the antagonist, you're gonna draw that muscle through its complete range of motion. That's gonna create what we call reciprocal inhibition. So autogenic inhibition is pressing that makes one inhibit the other. Reciprocal inhibition is where if I contract my pec muscle, it will tell my upper back to relax. But if I contract my upper back muscle, it will tell my pec to relax. So if I'm trying to stretch out my pec and I contract my upper back over and over again, I'm basically sending signals that say contract, relax, contract, relax, right? And then so I'm saying, shut down, relax, relax, relax. That's really great because that might give me a deeper range of motion. So maybe I do a hamstring stretch, right? Uh, you would never do this standing, but maybe I would go like this um, and I would stretch it and then relax and I'd stretch it and then relax. That's contracting my quad, which is causing my knee to extend. And that's causing my hamstring. My hamstring is getting a signal that says, shut down. Hey, turn off. Hey, Brad's hamstrings. Holy crap, you are tight. Shut up. <laughs> it's telling them to relax, right? And that is reciprocal inhibition, contracting one muscle to relax another. Um, we like having different types of stretches. Static stretches are great at improving your range of motion. But remember, this is all about shutting a signal down, right? By putting the Golgi tendon organ to tell the muscle spindle to shut down. Well, you know, your muscle spindles aren't only in charge of sensing things. They're also in charge of like helping create contractions. So if you're turning your muscle off, that might not have super positive effects, right? By turning, you know, your muscles off through a static stretch, um, your muscles actually might be weaker at the end. Uh, and so we don't wanna do that if we're trying to lift really, really heavy that day. 
So static stretches are really good if you're lifting at a low intensity, but they're not so good if you're lifting at a high intensity. So strength and power athletes should avoid static stretches before their heavy lifting days. Um, but active stretches don't have that problem. Active stretches are great. They actually haven't been shown to have that inhibitory effect. So that might be a really effective way at improving your mobility without uh, sacrificing your strength. Uh, and then we got dynamic stretches. Dynamic stretches are, you know, a lot of the ones you think of when you think about like an athlete warming up. So like arm swings, arm circles, even body weight squats, walking lunges with a twist, um, straight leg kicks, all of that stuff. Those are your dynamic stretches. You're actually using your uh, strength and momentum uh, and you're increasing your range of motion that way. So these are actually using stretch shortening cycles. When you move really explosively like that, you remember that thing we talked about earlier where your nervous system kind of freaks out for a second? Like when you rapidly stretch something, the muscle wants to snap back the other way, right? You know, you can even see it right there. Like when I rapidly stretch my chest, notice how it bounces back forward. Um, that's my nervous system going, whoa, too long, too fast. And so it pulls back the other way, right? It doesn't want to rip the rubber band. Um, well, if I were to like swing my arms over and over and over again, I would be creating those stretch shortening cycles in my chest over and over and over again. That's gonna be great at giving me an increased range of motion because a whole bunch of blood flow is gonna go to the area. So I might get my range of motion temporarily, but it's not a great way for me to make myself more flexible in the long run. That's really not what dynamic stretches are for. You wanna improve your mobility, go to static stretches. You want to make yourself a little more flexible temporarily. Dynamic stretches are a good way to get your heart rate up, get some blood flow um, before like a heavy workout session. The other thing is by creating those little stretch cycles, your nervous system gets turned on like crazy. So now it's also going to help you lift really, really, really heavy. So dynamic stretches are great because like they can increase your core temperature. They can, they can make you, you know, they, they get your, um, uh, your heart rate up a little bit, uh, and they create those little stretch shortening cycles, which would be great if you're going to lift powerful or if you're going to lift really heavy, but totally inappropriate for a client who's trying to like improve their range of motion. So we're starting to see three categories of stretches here. So we got static stretches for increasing range of motion, active stretches for increasing range of motion without like losing any strength, and dynamic stretches, which actually might decrease range of motion, but they will increase power output. So beginner client who's starting out, I wanna improve their mobility. A strength client, I don't want them to lose any strength. And an athlete, I want them to be very explosive. So we start to see why we have different types of stretches for each. Now, there is sort of one hybrid stretch here at the very end, which is called proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation or PNF stretching. This is not something you're going to learn here in the core. This is actually something you're going to learn in capstone with Mo. Um, but PNF stretches are a very special stretching technique that trainers, this is where you're actually going to have your hands on your client and you're going to help them. You're going to manually stretch them using this technique. Um, this is basically a hybrid between static and active. It's kind of putting both concepts together. You're using reciprocal and autogenic inhibition simultaneously. And so these are stretches that uh, require a partner to actively stretch their participant uh, by some combination of alternating between contracting and relaxing of your agonist and antagonist muscles. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna draw a muscle through its complete range of motion for 20 to 30 seconds. So you're literally just doing a static stretch for the first part. Then you're gonna instruct that client to contract that muscle for about seven to 15 seconds. That's the active part, right? Then they relax and you stretch them for another into a deeper range of motion for the next 20 to 30 seconds, right? So you can see a picture of that right here, right? You can see he's stretching their calf muscle. Um, so he's using his forearm to push their foot into dorsiflexion and he's stabilizing their ankle with his hand here. And so what he's gonna do is he's gonna move it through the full range of motion, hold for 20 to 30 seconds. Then he's going to instruct her to push against his forearm with her foot uh, for about seven to 15 seconds. Then he's going to instruct her to relax and he's going to stretch that into a deeper range of motion for the next rep for another 20 to 30 seconds. You might repeat that for three to uh, two to three repetitions. 
Um, right, so neuromuscular stretching or PNF stretching, uh, your contraction is about seven to 15 seconds, your stretch is 20 to 30 seconds, don't squeeze too hard, and you're going to do anywhere from one to three reps of that. Um, shouldn't be doing this with certain clients if they have like an acute injury in the area, if they have a pulled muscle or something like that. Um, don't do this kind of thing. If they have hypertension, be cautious with this type of thing. Seniors, be cautious. Their, their tendons are very tight. Um, the joint, uh, joint replacement therapy, be careful with that. Um, but it's taking advantage of both situations, autogenic and reciprocal, right? So imagine if I had someone, you know, I uh, grabbed my hamstring and they stretched it out, right? I'd be getting a static stretch. And then if I pull, right, for seven to 15 seconds, uh, I'm getting an active stretch. And then I would relax and stretch into a deeper range of motion for the remaining, you know, 20 to 30 seconds. So I know that's a really brief rundown of PNF stretching. We are going to practice this um, on Wednesday. <laughs> Wait, day nine, 10, skip 11, 12. Yeah, on Wednesday, we're gonna, when we get together in the park, we're going to do some PNF stretching. Um, and that'll be sort of our in, par, in the park lecture this week. Um, but yeah, that's actually all I got for you guys today. How you feeling? Any questions? Nope. Feeling good, guys? Yep. Love it. All right. Well, that's all I got for you. Um, uh, like I mentioned, we have school off on Martin Luther King Day on Monday. So uh, no class on Monday. Be prepared for that. Um, uh, which means that our final class this week is you know, tomorrow. And then we got our three-day weekend. Uh, we'll have homework number four. Our final piece of homework is going to go out tomorrow um, on Friday. So be prepped for that. Um, and then we'll have our final on Wednesday along with our in the park meeting. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and end today's call and I'll see everybody tomorrow.